Alessandro Zattoni che è il capo dipartimento imprese e management della LUIS non senza ringraziarlo e pregando di trasmettere il ringraziamento per la preziosa ospitalità che ci danno nella mia università Permette, permettete questo piccolo richiamo personale che mia nel senso che non sono azionista ma io vengo da qui anzi sono il residuo della Prodeo da cui è nata la LUIS, sono l'ultimo professore ordinario di quella università che penso, voi sappiate, la chiamavano gli studenti per Dio, non Prodeo, che era l'esclamazione che facevano quando le cose non funzionavano bene. Sorry if I ever speak until now in Italian. Allora do la parola al professor Zattoni e iniziano i lavori. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's an honor for Luis to host this event. We already organized other events in the, in the past, and I hope there will be more events in the future, because with CONSOB we have a passion for bringing new knowledge, sharing new knowledge, where well, practitioners, academics can work together, and I like corporate governance, my topic of research, so anytime there is some, some event like this, it's really a pleasure. And with CONSOB we are so close also physically, that we like to organize this event. And I hope this will, event will be very beneficial for you. And you can get a lot of insight from Caroline Pham. Uh, the curriculum is impressive. So I, I can just say a few words about Caroline. It's impressive because she, she works basically in the business uh, as an executive of a very important bank, but also she is involved a bit as academic. Also, she has several experiences as academic, but also as a regulator. So, And the topic that we analyze today is quite of important. Uh, it's probably the topic or one of the hottest topic in the future. And Caroline has experience and knowledge to help us to navigate the difficulties to interpreting and understanding this topic. So uh, on my side, thanks very much again for CONSOP. Uh, I'm sure this will be a day we will remember because we will learn a lot about a very interesting and debated topic. Thanks again to Paolo Savona because it's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Zattoni. Zattoni already said that uh, Caroline Pham has an impressive CV. First, as a top-level student and researcher, then as a private manager, and now as a member of the board of the Com Commodity Futures Trade Commission, which is the authority of derivatives, which is autonomous with respect to the Security Exchange Commission. Instead, in Consob, as you know, we have inside the, the derivative supervisory activity with, with some limits so not fully uh, uh, in charge of uh, do this kind of uh, uh, business. When I read the recent Eurofi Prague speech on metaverse given by uh, uh, Caroline Pham, my reaction was we need to hear her and discuss the following statement. I quote, the uh, statement from the speech of um, Caroline Pham. The great debate over crypto may be only a waypoint on the journey to metaverse. Ay, ay, ay. We are working, yes. <laughs> and I jumped on my chair and I said, uh, because we are organized to approach the problem of cryptoverse, and we say, okay, is, is is a way to a different uh, uh, goal uh, uh, called metaverso. And this is why I invite, invite her, the consul invite her, and I give immediately the floor to speak about financial regulatory and the supervisory authorities facing the metaverse. Thank you again for coming, and I give the floor to you.
Well, it is such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today, particularly after such glowing introductions. Um, thank you again to Luis for hosting me, and thank you so much to Consob and to Chairman Savona and to Carlo for the invitation and for organizing this great event. So I hope I can only live up to the uh, headlines and to the <laughs> promotion. Um, before I begin my speech, I would like to just provide my standard disclaimer, uh, which is typical for all US government officials, which is that the views that I'm sharing today are just those of my own as a commissioner and do not reflect those of the CFTC necessarily or of any other commissioner. So indeed, this is the big question that is before us. What is the metaverse? And what are we doing? And are we going there? And what are the steps that it will take for us to achieve this? And so I would like to talk about each of these things as well as to talk about uh, what, what is it, because we are so consumed today by discussing digital assets, by crypto assets, by coming up with comprehensive regulatory frameworks to deal with crypto assets, by considering the systemic risk implications. Of course, indeed, the only thing that could take me away from Washington is to come here to Rome. Uh, because, of course, as everyone knows, the G20 are meeting in Washington this week, and they have the World Bank and the IMF meetings. But I could not turn down the opportunity to travel to Italy and to be here and, uh, and to engage with the ecosystem of uh, many different open protocols and blockchains where people are trying to build a more inclusive financial system, one that helps to break down barriers in the cross-border space to make remittances and payments more accessible, faster, more efficient, and to reduce uh, various risks. But as we think about reducing risks and in making uh, financial services more efficient, we have to always consider um, the, the risks as well as the opportunities and how to take a more balanced approach. So as we begin this talk, I thought I would share with you just some of my, my thinking as I was in Rome last night walking around, and it was so beautiful, my first time here. And what was stunning to me was seeing the ruins that are everywhere, to see the Colosseum, to see the Circus Maximus, to see the Forum, and all around the remains of the great city of Rome uh, during the Roman Empire, you also have a modern Rome. You have all of these new buildings that are built up amongst the ruins over on top of even incorporating in some aspects some of these you know, ancient foundations. And to me, the way I think about the metaverse is very similar. We have the existing world. And of course, here in Rome, you count time in centuries. I am from the United States, which is a very young country. Uh, but Rome here has been for 2,000 years or so, uh, really a center of civilization. And so when we think about the foundation of civilization, we think about the world that we live in, it is like these ruins. And yet, when we think about the metaverse, that's like the new world that is overlaid on top of our existing world. It is an integration. It is something where we are existing in both the past as well as the present, and we are thinking about the future. And so this is the way I like to think about the metaverse, not that it is something that is going to tear down everything that we know or that we are going to be wearing you know, H VR headsets and walking around uh, you know, in this totally virtual world, but rather that we will have a, a more full experience where we are in our current physical world and yet it will be augmented, it will be enriched by the possibilities of having an open internet, uh, by having augmented reality or virtual reality. So I wanted to level set with that first because I know many people have different conceptions of the metaverse and so I think this is an important one for me. So I would like to share with you uh, some more specific thoughts here on what is the metaverse, and, um, and indeed even some statistics. So when we think about the metaverse, as I've just described, us living in our existing world as well as our future world, it's really showing that the metaverse is far more than speculation on crypto assets. It is the real business of the virtual world, as it was described in a recent McKinsey report. Some describe the metaverse as the next iteration of the internet, something we're immersed in, a three-dimensional version. And I think that is very compelling. There's another vision of the metaverse that focuses on the ability to have a unique identity coupled with an economy. And people discuss that this idea of an economy is really what distinguishes the metaverse from gaming. 
gaming video games, uh, many of you uh, may have either perhaps seen these or your children, uh, as my daughter uh, during COVID was playing Roblox and I was wondering what she was doing. And even she has asked for her allowance to now be given to her in Robux instead of the US dollar. So she has moved beyond dollarization and is now just in virtual currencies. So I thought that was a very funny story, but COVID has forced many changes for all of us. And it's not just the way that we work, all of us have been on Zoom. Um, and in many ways, some of the most immediate impacts of metaverse engagement are with workplace collaboration. You have seen reports that uh, one of the, the major uh, products that Meta has been launching is around workplace collaboration. And they will. there are other gaming companies that are looking to have contracts with some of the major conglomerates in South Korea, where I was recently for Korea Blockchain Week. And there, they will roll out this workplace collaboration in the metaverse uh, across all the employees uh, in the near term. I mean, this is something that is, you know, in, in six months, possibly, you could be seeing this. And when I saw these demos of the metaverse, it's not so different than what we're used to today. It seemed you know, how do we shift from in-person business meetings and that kind of collaboration to all of a sudden doing everything on a screen? You know, I used to sit on a trading floor and a trading floor is almost the epitome of something that should be physical, where everybody is sitting there together. And to think that you could take a trading floor and to have it be virtual, this is something that nobody could have imagined. But I think COVID has forced us to reimagine our work and our life in many ways. And in some, because of that, it has created an openness, an openness to thinking beyond what we are used to. And when we think about this openness and how it's going to change our work and our life, that is where, as regulators and as supervisors, we have to consider some of these changes. So for example, in the early days of COVID, when we moved beyond the physical, there were many rules and requirements around the world and in the United States, some specific ones that are very focused on your location. Uh, so for example, um, everywhere you have a, a financial advisor is considered a branch of the office. Well, if you have a workforce of several thousand and they are all working from home, how can it be that each one of their houses is a branch office? That is something that becomes easily very unmanageable. Uh, there's other requirements for you know, physical or, or wet signatures. That's something, again, in a remote world, um, particularly when you have requirements around uh, document control. You can't have people printing these documents at home. That becomes an operational risk and a security issue. So we have to consider digital signatures, and there are some very official documents where that's not something that people think of. So I think that not only COVID uh, sort of breaking that first barrier, but as we think about the digitalization of finance and we think about the possibilities that our financial system, uh, payments, um, trading, settlement, clearing, all of these activities being digitally native on a blockchain or a distributed ledger technology, we have to consider how we modernize our regulations to make them fit for purpose so that they too are suitable in a digitally native world. And we move away from some of these concepts and we think about it almost with a, a fresh approach. But to me, a fresh approach does not necessarily mean that you need to start by throwing everything that you're used to out the door. Just as when you have these, these beautiful buildings and these beautiful ruins here around the city, you don't throw those all away. You consider how to incorporate them into what it is you're building. And so I hope that we as regulators consider that as we are putting together all of this future approach to a future digitalized world that we are not throwing everything completely out of the window, but that we are really considering what does it mean to modernize it and update it for this future metaverse. When I think about the metaverse, um, there is a very important debate that many people have, and that is tied up in the concept of Web3. And this will also touch upon crypto assets, um, as was uh, Chairman Savona mentioned in his statement that he had called out. So what is Web3 then? Web3 is this future conception of a, an open internet, what some call the internet of value, 
but indeed moving beyond just an internet of value, but this idea of an internet of ownership. The idea is that by using the distributed ledger technology and in having NFTs, non-fungible tokens that are unique and identifiable and are able to be verified in a trustless format, this is something that's going to allow for true digital identity that is portable, that is verifiable, that is unique, and that is secure, and that this then will allow you, for example, if you are an artist and you have a song, and so you have this unique identifier associated with that song, you can build a smart contract that will allow for the royalties for this to be immediately paid to you, and it is self-executing. It's really interesting when you think about this because in having an internet of ownership, maybe what we are talking about is the next generation of truly digital rights management. Because what, after all, is this concept of a token? Is it perhaps really just a digital right? It is the right to own something, to use something, or to transfer something. This, I think, is a very important way to think about it because oftentimes in thinking about Web3 or in crypto assets, many people are very caught up with the speculative nature of many of these assets. And indeed, there are many scams and frauds that are out there where people are taking advantage of people and they are just trying to perhaps be engaging in capital raising activities. But for that, we have a framework. We have our securities laws. We have laws around banking products, around payment products. And so there it is important to go and look at the true economics of some of these products. And then I think that is almost an easy concept to understand, although it's very challenging to work out in details. So when you put that aside, then you are left with these instruments or these, these rights, these digital rights, and you consider what are they? And so that is where I have talked in the past about utility tokens. And this is an idea that it, the, the token is really a thing. And especially for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, I like to consider that we regulate things. A commodity in the United States is a very broad concept. And it is really something where you are talking about a good, an article, a service, or a right. Uh, those, those are things. And utility tokens are part of that fabric of the Web3 that the metaverse would be built on, where it is a token that gives you a right to perhaps enter uh, one of these worlds in the metaverse. So for example, if you are doing a workplace collaboration, perhaps you are using the utility tokens to pay for your time. Uh, you are exchanging that for your time, just as in a video game arcade in old days, you would have a token and that would give you access to that. I use these examples about workplace collaboration because they are the most near term and I think they are also the easiest for us all to think about conceptually, again, given the considerations that we have been living in a Zoom world all of this time. So one of the things when we think about what the metaverse is and what it is not, and what is the relationship with Web3 and how Web3 is not necessarily a necessary condition for the metaverse, but indeed it could be one that unlocks and opens up the true open metaverse. And so this is where I would like to share with you some statistics about what people think and talk about the potential of what the metaverse is. You know, I believe that the metaverse is here now. The corporations, venture capital, and private equity have invested more than $120 billion into the metaverse space in the first five months of 2022. And in this same McKinsey report that I recently described, there are more than 95% of business leaders that expect the metaverse to have a positive impact on their industry within five to 10 years, and 61% expect it to moderately change the way their industry operates. And as far as the industries that are impacted, that would be consumer and retail, media and telecommunications, and healthcare. And those industries are already among those undertaking these metaverse initiatives. And these are major mainstream consumer brands beyond the large technology companies like Meta, formerly Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Alphabet or Google. For example, I was recently at the NFL, the National Football League, at their headquarters in New York City. And they are looking at tokens and Web3 and NFTs as a way to enhance digital fan engagement. Uh, many of you are probably already much more familiar with this because many of the football leagues, so real football, not American football, uh, already use these tokens to promote their digital fan engagement, to create 
clubs to allow fans to vote on, for example, which jerseys will be worn in a particular game or in some of the different access or benefits. So this again goes to this idea of utility and of these tokens being, it's, it's not just financial. Just because you can financialize something does not mean that it is necessarily financial in nature. And so while we are working through all these issues of systemic risk, I think we have to, at the same time, put that aside and consider the real economy and the ways that these things can be used in the real economy. So now, where does that put us as regulators? What are the policy questions that we need to deal with and how will we answer these? I do not have all the answers, but I do have perhaps some questions or some points that will spur greater dialogue and discussion amongst the international regulatory community and will be a way for us to put all of these important questions that we are dealing with in crypto assets into the context of what does it mean for a future metaverse. And so the first question, of course, is timing. How much time do we as regulators have to consider when this is happening to us and, and, and what will it take for us to be prepared so that we can be proactive in our approach uh, to regulations and not reactive? We are not you know, looking at this after a crisis has already happened, but instead that we are embedding the regulatory considerations into the design of new products or even into the design of the metaverse itself. When I have been discussing with various venture capital firms, for example, or other technology firms that have been building the metaverse, I always ask them, is this something that is a near term in the next one to two years? Is it something that is five years away, 10 years away, 20 years? What do you think? And of course, they all you know, uh, caveat it and say, oh, well, we can't so, we can't time it, we don't know. But when they point out the very real infrastructure requirements that are necessary and the technological requirements that are necessary to support a metaverse where everybody is online at the same time and it's doing the graphics rendering and it's able to maintain all of these connections and still deliver a real-time enriched experience like you're watching a movie and not something that's kind of glitching and, and, and um, breaking up. They say it's probably 10 years away at the least before the infrastructure and the technological advancements get there. And these areas of development will include computing, network, hardware, uh, database, and, and cloud is, is very important for supporting some of these uh, world. So in the gaming space, which is more advanced, and they're used to having massively multiplayer games, uh, one very major gaming company that is entering the metaverse or is in the metaverse has said that they've discovered this new technology that is cloud-based. And so that is something that they think will allow for that next unlocking of being able to support the data needs, the real-time data streaming needs of all of this. So. As a side note, one of the things that we are struggling with as regulators is also around cloud infrastructures. Is cloud a critical national infrastructure? Is cloud a financial market infrastructure? And if so, how do we supervise it? And should the PFMIs, for example, apply to cloud? Uh, how is cloud too big to be considered through traditional third-party risk management frameworks? And is it something that ought to be directly regulated uh, and subject to examination by authorities. This is another thing where some of the debates of the day uh, could again be put into the context of this world where we have the virtual layer on top of our physical layer and we need to consider about the implications of that. So here are some key areas that need to be further developed and matured to achieve the full metaverse and its potential for engagement, community building, self-expression, and commerce. They include the technologies I've described, the commercial infrastructure, so your on-ramps and off-ramps in the metaverse. How do people engage? Will it be like walking into a storefront? Or will it be like dialing into a Zoom meeting? What, what will that look like? The privacy and identity, which this is not a big tech uh, lecture, we can save that for another time, but there are very important conversations which Europe has been leading, of course, with GDPR in the discussions of privacy and identity. Workforce of the future, as I've described all of the different workplace collaboration tools that have the most near-term impact, and then regulation, tax, accounting, and social infrastructure. 
So the question that stands out here uh, from my perspective, particularly as a financial regulator, so how do, we, how do regulators address the development of solutions and services to support these virtual worlds that are globally accessible but may be required to adhere to local jurisdictional requirements and rules in commerce and payments? This is one that can seem to be, again, a question that is overwhelming. But I don't think that this is a new question because it's a further extension of how regulators have approached globalization and past technological innovations that enable cross-border activity. So although this has been presented as one of the most difficult questions, I think this is one that is actually more approachable for us as we've considered the lessons we've learned since the 1990s. So just as regulators have had to tackle the digitalization of finance, so too must we look ahead to the future and the increasing digitalization of life. In many ways, much of our life involves transactions. So some say that the foundational layers of the metaverse, which are the enablers, are security, privacy and governance, identity, and payments and monetization. Again, these are issues where we have tackled each of these areas, and so I think that we can apply the learnings here and take that same approach to the metaverse. Some other critical issues for policymakers to consider include open access to the metaverse. So again, when we talk about access to markets or we talk about access to uh, financial products and services, this isn't just access for marginalized communities, but when we think about it from a global or cross-border context, we must also think about it from the perspective of developing economies. This is again something which is by design from the very beginning borderless. And so just as we are thinking about these things in the Western world and uh, in Asia and Pacific, I think we must also consider the developing economies and the impact that this could have for humanitarian aid and for economic development. There's also competition and promoting innovation. Again, as I've talked about briefly with big tech, there is the real concern that people will come to own this virtual world and given its import and that we will be existing in it simultaneously, we need to consider what it means if a conglomerate, a private company for profit, controls and owns these areas. So the same questions that have been dealt with there have to also be considered in the metaverse. There's the intellectual property rights, as I've discussed, commerce, monetization, and distribution models between stakeholders, which I think is a further extension of many of these international trade debates that we've had, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, securing user safety and awareness, and ensuring the data privacy. Beyond that, I think we also have to consider what it means for the broader societal implications. Many people are worried about the metaverse because just as we are worried about our children sitting at video games all day long, what if there are people who are only living in a virtual world and are neglecting the day-to-day -day life, what it means to sit down at a cafe with friends or to many of the discussions around the future of work where we wonder what will break down if we are not in offices together with our colleagues but are instead all hybrid. And these are important questions and I think that's why there needs to be a roadmap that is defined towards a metaverse that is ethical, safe, and inclusive. So I think the rules that will be necessary here are data privacy, again a further extension of the good work that has been done in that space, Security, and it's not just cybersecurity, but also almost an extension of physical security. If people are being bullied and harassed on message boards or on uh, social networks, what does it mean when you have a even more immersive experience where that bullying and that harassment will feel just as real as if somebody was in your face in the real world? I think these are real security concerns that we need to think about. There's ethics and regulatory compliance, uh, physical health and safety, as I've described, and the equity and the fairness. So because the metaverse development is still in its early stages, I believe a principles-based approach to emerging policy issues appropriately reflects the need to anticipate and adapt to issues and risks quickly. And I think it's imperative for regulators, as CONSAB is doing, to proactively engage with the private sector and to ensure the responsible development of products and services that have embedded protections. 
This is one of the reasons why I have been visiting all the regulators around the world to learn more about how they engage with the private sector and to learn about their approaches to fintech innovation and to regulatory sandboxes. In the United States, we have not had a true regulatory sandbox. And I think part of that is because by design, the SEC and the CFTC are enforcement agencies. We are market regulators. We are there to police against market abuses and misconduct. But I do think that there is a framework for a pilot program where we can consider having the right safeguards and guardrails in place where we can work with these firms and not just do outreach and engagement, but to truly look at their use cases and what their roadmap is for a minimum viable product, and then to have almost a trade-off. So in having them come in and for them to work with us on a path to full registration, we also will have a closer supervision. It's a more heightened supervisory model, closer monitoring, regular check-ins to see how these products are being rolled out, to see how with a limited target audience, for example, the reception is what controls are in place, what risk management and compliance programs are being built into it. So I think that that is one path to consider towards a pilot regime uh, with the CFTC, for example. And so I look forward as I continue to get learnings and observations, including from CONSOB and with their fintech initiatives, uh, how the US could do something similar as well. So, what do we do? Where do we go from here? What is, what is next? Well, just as business leaders need to identify a strategy for the metaverse, it is incumbent upon regulators to do the same. We need to learn more about the metaverse. We need to assess the policy issues, some of which I've just described. We have to create expertise and resource. And this is a particular point that I think is very important because to find these talent and resources, they are often in the private sector. But how do regulators main, become competitive with the private sector? We cannot offer the same salaries, but we have to offer the mission and the purpose and the idea that we are all building this better world. And so I think we do need to consider very much, particularly in the United States, when there is almost a, a bias against people with private sector experience. I'm not quite sure how I got confirmed to my job, actually. <laughs> Uh, how do we bring those in? How do we attract them and how do we retain them? Because it's going to be necessary that we have people with the hands-on experience who have actually built these products, who have worked with clients, and who have worked with the best experts on the technological aspects. Uh, we have to connect with other policymakers, which is why I'm so glad to be here with you all today. And we have to establish a regulatory approach that is fit for purpose with each of our singular legal structures and authorities. Just as many say in the United States that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach for our markets, it's so true on the global stage as well. And it's very important that we have to ensure global cooperation and coordination because the metaverse is truly a world without borders. I hope that as I continue my trip here, as I walk around Rome again tonight, as I sit at a cafe and as I look at everything, I think about how do we look a thousand years into the future? How do we consider that the structures that we are building today are growing and evolving right along what we have existing? How do we be open-minded? And how do we embrace the unknown, but with the confidence that we will be able to take it head on? Thank you so much. Excellent. The discussion is open. Rainer, vuoi prendere la parola? Paolo, vuoi prendere la parola? No, no. Prima gli ospiti e poi lui è ospitante. Professor Masera. I think it's better to stay there. Thank you, everybody, and uh, above all, Paolo uh, Savona and our guest. It is a pleasure, true pleasure, to be here today. Um, I greatly appreciated uh, your speech, and I will read it carefully once it's made available to us. But I think it would be inappropriate for me simply to say how interesting, important, uh, and forward-looking 
your speech was, is, and I will concentrate in a few minutes on some question marks I have. Um, the question marks are perhaps uh, threefold. The first point is that uh, you and uh, Paolo Savona now is uh, sharing this view. You concentrate on the metaverse. This is perhaps important. This is perhaps the way a thousand years from now, a hundred years, 20 years from now, everything will, will go. But uh, there are some question marks. There are some question marks. And I see three lines. One is the development of Web 1.0. Web 1.0 became Web 2.0. And now, as we all know, we are all talking about Web 3.0. Web 3.0, in my, I have to be very short, uh, in my view, is uh, an important element of the entire new world, but it has to be kept distinct and separate from the infosphere and the metaverse. You did not even mention the infosphere. This is perhaps uh, the metaverse uh, looks like uh, the way to approach new things in the brave new world we are embracing. I have all my doubts. And uh, here, <laughs> I took many lessons from Paolo Savona. Perhaps I misinterpret him now, but I will draw your attention to one key point. Uh, the infosphere is heavily involved, intertwined with defense of fence matters. If we don't understand that, we don't understand how the whole system will develop. I had the pleasure, I repeat, I have to be brief. Uh, I will send you some of the papers which uh, I produced on these points. But uh, let me draw attention to a very important, if little known, work by a US general by the name of Oleg Bemiro, who produced uh, in 2014 a very interesting thesis which was accepted by uh, the military authorities was declassified and so it is now readily and easily available. Uh, here again, I have to be brief, but his main point, or one of his main points was that uh, as the internet developed from defense, and it was a technology which was built to create uh, uh, defensive opportunities for the United States and for NATO later, uh, much the same thing goes on now. And the way, however, you share, you share the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, becomes a terrible danger for those who use these uh, technologies for defense, offense purposes. He was clear. Def defense is a misnomer for, for offense. And he made the point to the US military authorities that they had to look very carefully into it. Uh, I have to close, but I want to draw some conclusion from what I just indicated. If you take uh, that the infosphere is still a relevant uh, concept. The infosphere can be defined as a broad domain of information, data, knowledge, artificial intelligence, crypto, and cyber realities. Is it the same thing as the metaverse? No, I believe it is not, for, for many reasons. But it contains the cyberspace and the cyber triad. Now, if you take the view, for instance, that the difficulties of Russia now lies in part not only in the relative weakness from a GDP point of view of, uh, of Russia. Russia has a GDP which is much lower than the Italian one. Uh, now, of course, you have to make many adjustments, but uh, certainly there is a fundamental weakness there. But the major weakness which emerged, I think this is... Uh, 
a view shared by many, uh, by many military experts uh, with whom we often uh, speak. They believed that they had a control of the infosphere, which they did not. And this explains uh, why, at the beginning, they, th they thought that uh, the whole war could be uh, relatively easy, and, and they had to make recourse to ordinary techniques. Uh, you speak about the metaverse, but what happened to these eight, ten you, uh, Russian generals who thought they would be able to use uh, the uh, infrastructure in a secret way, and yet uh, they were caught by the uh, uh, counter elements uh, which uh, NATO gave uh, to Ukraine. I close now. Uh, if you believe that there is a close relationship between defense, offense in the future world, in the current world, and that the quest for global leadership between notably the United States and China will rest on control of the infosphere, then a number of questions to you follow. First, it is by no means clear that the idea that you have a peaceful convergence between the, the, the major countries between in Europe with the developing countries becomes a very significant question mark, which I pose again to, again to you. Not only that, but if you, and this is a point which you made, uh, I cut, uh, if the quest for the infosphere and the control of the infosphere becomes a major geopolitical issue, then many of the forward-looking conclusions that you made may be put into question. This is my comment. Thank you. This is an important question. I thank you very much for the thought that you put into that. And I do typically try to have more of a, a optimistic and a positive approach to considering things because, of course, we are looking at opportunities and then there are the risks. Um, since I am a financial regulator, I do not venture much into the realm of national security, but of course this is something that is first and foremost on everybody's minds. And indeed, global markets are, of course, very integral to national security, and especially as we are considering the energy crisis and what it means to have energy security. So maybe some thoughts just briefly on that. Uh, absolutely. As each of the, of the almost common goods or, or platforms that we have in the world can be monopolized and used to further uh, harmful uh, or even uh, human rights abuses, for example, that is something where you have an arms race. There will certainly could be an arms race in the metaverse, and I think that is why many countries, similar to what we saw in the rush towards crypto assets, could be looking at that as something strategic for their national security and for their concerns. So I think that's why it's incumbent upon regulators to not regulate this technology out of existence, but instead to consider all of the uh, significance that it could have for national security and that we too need to develop our uh, resources and capabilities in this space so that we are not flat-footed. Because when I think about some of the issues in the current infosphere, um, what came to me when you were discussing in particular uh, with Russia, and of course, much debate uh, on state actors uh, interfering in uh, other countries' politics and on uh, elections and in the media and in propaganda and the, and the discussion around deep fakes, for example. So there are videos that go viral. These are deep fakes. What happens if you have a deep fake metaverse? Somebody thinks that they're in reality, but it's actually completely artificial and constructed. And what does that mean? So I think this is a very important consideration. I think this is why we, we can't just say, oh no, this is something that we need to regulate against. But no, it, it may be inevitable. So we should be prepared when we look at it. Uh, maybe one other thought that I will um, leave you with, but this is a topic that merits much further discussion and by national security experts. Uh, 
I did mention in my speech at Eurofi a reference to the network state. I did not discuss too much about that, um, or at all actually, in today's talk. But the network state is this idea of almost transcending nation states and instead having a state that is built on the network and that is a affiliation of uh, people from all over the world who believe in, in something. So it's almost, I think it is fitting that, that we think about how religion, for example, could be something organizing that people affiliate with and that through the technology of the infosphere of the network and of the metaverse that they could organize themselves into a powerful force and that could be one example of a network state. You could have uh, non-state actors, uh, terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, for example, uh, that organize a network state for themselves. And it is something where do we consider that this becomes uh, a, a even more modern type of warfare where we control information and where that is uh, another level on which we have to consider national security issues and, and modern warfare. And I'll close with just the last thought, which is that in the debate around stable coins, for example, do we have a future world where there is the US dollar system, uh, much like today, and perhaps that's augmented by, by CBDCs, but even if it is uh, based on tokens, it is still a US dollar system. Do we then have a competing monetary system that is built on the digital yuan and on the Chinese sphere of influence and on the direct investment that they have made in Africa, in South America, and, and that is a competing monetary system that is, they are locked into because you have to accept the digital yuan for the direct investment. And then do we have the emergence of a, a third uh, non-state currency, much as everyone was concerned about with uh, Facebook's Libra, and, and that becomes something that really threatens the integrity of our monetary system, that we have these three competing monetary systems. And so, not to s scare everybody or to take us down that road, but these are very important considerations why I think we can't put our head in the sand and just say, oh, this is all speculation, this is people losing their money. There's much more at stake, um, although those are all terrible things, but there's much more at stake than, than just the wild speculation in crypto assets. Thank you. Grazie. Paolo. Paolo Ciocca is one of the five members of the board of a council. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Karen, for the opportunity. And uh, um, well, uh, I'll try to keep my uh, reflections short to the point, and uh, but still building on on what you proposed and what uh, Professor Mazera proposed too. And I think just to go straight on your last thoughts, which were on the crossing of our discussion with national security, I wouldn't have a doubt in answering yes to your questions whether these uh, may become instruments of warfare. There's, there's no doubt about that, I would say. And maybe less, uh, less theoretical and more substantive, I mean, I just can think beyond the ordinary thought that each and everything can be used in both ways, which is obvious. On the other hand, uh, this crosses um, main points of discussion of the international order. I'm thinking of net neutrality, because up to now, net neutrality has been, we know, for the Western world, <laughs> the issue, not agreed upon by China and Russia, quite straightly. We have a major turn in the ITU, so I welcome <laughs> The new, the new, how to say, the new leadership there, good. Still the issue is on the table. And uh, number one. Number two, through metaverse, I would imagine that on the other hand, one has the need of a, an increase in band. There's no doubt. I mean, all of this may work on a 5G context, uh, not, not on something else, which then opens up, again, issues about... Uh, capability, 
levels of even I'm thinking of uh, uh, let's say uh, national context of uh, let's say availability of this band um, uh, uh, monopolies on this band no I could go further and I think if we don't f so my to be clear my intervention is more a sort of uh, let's say ballot points to this um, I take it as a sort of um, um, structured thanks to you uh, brainstorm but so one of the first ballots is yes answer yes to you two points but then one has as a western situation western world we have an agenda of issues that we need to tackle together straight straight and now so net neutrality being one and monopolies on on, on the net on the other then moving uh, i would say through let's say our we think a bit more under control domain of regulators, which I don't think is the case, it's controlled. So <laughs> the agenda then becomes a bit more crowded. And first of all, I would say an element of context again, which is what does, what I understand metaverse means in the short term, not in the medium term. To me, it's a short term because it's already happening now. We look at gaming, fine. Which then means that the next, uh, well, the, the, even now, the stage of development and evolution is all the services industry, I mean, as a whole. I'm thinking of, for example, uh, engineering design. Um, if I remember well, it was Boeing as first to say, shouldn't we uh, start having a uh, global engineering uh, design uh, division on metaverse which makes absolutely sense i could say i could think of other well coding is an obvious answer um, for example why not audit services coming to <laughs> our domains no? um, and i just can think uh, that, that for example for my children it will be maybe mine are already old and let's say about 20 uh, but the next generation will enter, simply will move from gaming into job on the metaverse. That's the continuum there. So today I game, tomorrow I'll work there. Or now, I go, <laughs> now, I, now I'm gaming and at the same time I'm working. So what does it mean that the metaverse is then, I would say, immersive and per definition always a fusion, no? Fusion of context free time, work time, uh, and whatever. Personal situation, personal time, uh, official time, say time to give a boundary. Then for us regulators, this is, this is the nightmare. Because all our regulations are always in a sort of black and white of an official duty, <laughs> a personal duty. I'm thinking, for example, on conflict of interest, just to take the easiest one. And how do you police, oh, and sorry, how do you regulate, and the more how you police, for example, conflicts on the interest of the same person who's, who's uh, let's say, gaming, then, uh, then working, and then investing, always in the same environment. And just to say one thing, so conflict of interest in general. Then for us Europeans, I would say if it is immersive and it is a, fusion the first victim is uh, privacy obviously <laughs> so uh, the way we currently uh, regulate and 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 think about uh, and and we have a we have a worldwide let's say decent standard obviously this will come under discussion in a in a in a in a in a metaverse situation because per definition if it's a fusion when do you draw the line into this, uh, in this context of so privacy? It's a second point. Then for a government, and I would say not only a national one, but for example, a regional one, Europe, but, but whoever, even before conflict of interests to say one, but I would say in general financial regulation and privacy matters, then there is tax to me. Because the value added that you produce into the, in that immersive environment, uh, how do you divide up 
geographically, but it, even again between a personal input and a, and a business input and so on. I'm a tax man as education in my first life, and so I just can see the crisis of a number of, let's say, of uh, OECD benchmarks <laughs> and pillars when you enter into that. Uh, you said, you said uh, rightly so, that, and you are absolutely right on this, what is the, what is the, let's say, the, um, uh, the pillar of this is cloud. There's no doubt about that. Then how do we, how do we, how do we um, regulate cloud? Well, Europe on this is coming up with a sort of solution, the DORA regulation, that on this means, for example, the move of the financial regulator for financial regulators, the move of the regulation up to the regional level. So no way at a national level you can get out of it. You bring it up to the European level and you try, I'm, I'm quite cautious because this has been approved but not yet enacted, a long way to go down, but still this, 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 if this is the way to, uh, to react when we have cloud in an ordinary situation, coming back to metaverse, which then means overall economy, service economy, moving into a virtual world, it will be, sorry, much more than that. I'm all, already, I would think I'm almost finished. Um, if I can read what I have. Um, well, uh, I still don't see the, the how to say, uh, speaking for us, I mean, as, as regulators, I don't see the awareness of this. No? Um, and the way this is a continuum, uh, and so, thinking to uh, Professor Masera saying in the next 10 years, uh, 20 years, no, I think it's much shorter than that because it goes by generations. So as soon as the generation, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of the one I know. So as soon as you have, for example, in a couple of years, in three years, I don't think that Meta is going with their investments that far to go into the 10 years. No, the, that I think in the one to five years, we had a cohort entering, let's say, with these new rules, which means from gaming into job into whatever, straight into the metaverse. I think this is the big bet by, by Meta and others. So, and, and so we will be faced with answers to this question, I think, not more than two, three years, that's it if we want to be prepared, or let's say if we go on a reaction way, uh, say max five. But this is again for discussion. Thank you again, Carol, for your contribution. Thank you. Okay. Prima di dar la parola a Carlo Comporti per non, monop per non monopolizzare a livello di Consob. C'è qualcuno non Consob che vuol prendere la parola? Prego. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Alessio De Vincenzo. I'm with the Bank of Italy and responsible for financial stability. Thanks. Yes, it didn't work actually. Uh, my name is Alessio Di Vincenzo. I'm with the Bank of Italy and responsible for financial stability. So uh, thanks a lot for your remarks, your thoughts. Uh, they were very inspiring. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, quick comments. First, I really appreciated uh, your vision of what you called uh, the fresh uh, approach uh, to uh, regulating, policing, uh, approaching this new uh, this new word, and I really like the, your idea and your metaphor about uh, uh, the Roman ruins uh, of putting together the two words. So this approach sometimes is not that, uh, that easy to implement. So we tend to divide this into two words, so the physical words and the virtual words. And, and it's true, I think we, we might end up in a mixed word, but, but the world will be uh, only one in the end. So we, sometimes we will... Uh, sit down with our friends in a coffee shop uh, to have our drinks, and sometimes we just uh, had uh, 
a video call with them and we'll, uh, we'll see. Uh, so this is something that it's, 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 very, it's, it's very important. So one thing that we are seeing, for, for instance, in our day-to-day uh, -day supervision uh, on, on uh, lenders, for instance, so this division between traditional lenders and digital lenders is something that is actually disappearing in, in our perception. So while we were discussing about these two differences, uh, in, in reality, so traditional lenders are no longer there. So they are simply evolving. And in the end, every lender will need to be a digital lender in this kind of world. And why we will, again, discussing, we were using uh, our traditional lenders on our phones uh, through digital applications. So but why, I mean, calling, still calling them traditional lenders. Having said that, I mean, the challenges that you were mentioning are really, uh, are really important. So uh, two comments, one on the really operational side. So enforcement. So when it comes to enforcing a, um, a smart contract, uh, so this, in principle, will have formidable challenges for, uh, for the usual way we looked at, at enforcement of standard contracts. So first, first of all, I mean, this idea of having a code uh, that can discipline and can envisage all the states of, of the world in a way, and can find a kind of solution to any kind of uh, state of the world that we will see, we might see, in the future is something that uh, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, so the way we call a contract today is something uh, in which, say, humbly enough, there are some state of the worlds that might be disciplined, but there are others that uh, we cannot foresee at the moment, especially in a world like this that... Uh, is characterized by this huge level of uh, uncertainty. So against this uh, concept like redress, uh, concept like uh, um, uh, make reference to a third party to decide on what is not stated in a contract, uh, it's something that uh, for uh, regulators, uh, enforcers, policers is something that it's important. So, it's, uh, it would be nice to, to, to have your view on this, on, this, uh, on this approach. And the second one, more general, uh, you were uh, rightly pointing to this, to this idea that actually not all uh, uh, product uh, that uh, uh, will end up being financialized uh, through this process are financial products uh, in nature. Uh, and you were talking uh, rightly so of uh, the need uh, uh, to reach for a, a new world or new regime in which uh, uh, it will be important that uh, it will be ethical, it will be safe, uh, and it will be inclusive. Uh, now, we live in a world in which uh, some part of this is ethical, but there are a lot of unethical uh, behaviors. Some part is safe, some part is unsafe. Uh, and in some cases, there are inclusiveness and in most others exclusiveness so uh, if this eventually will turn in 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 a much larger financialization of this products uh, with respect to the one that we have uh, uh, now and if eventually i mean th there is a risk that we might end up in a situation in which we can now we can go up to and, and uh, uh, up to um, uh, the top of a mountain, see a beautiful view from there. And uh, we can do this without any kind of relation to financialization. We might end up in a situation in which, uh, just, just to say, I mean, we will need a utility token to get there and have the utility of uh, uh, exploiting uh, the sensation of having a view from, a to from the top of a mountain. Um, so is, wouldn't this be too much of a burden uh, for, uh, let's say, financial regulators, financial policymakers, for the, uh, in general, for the financial side, when so many things will end up being this kind of financial label on it without being uh, financial in nature? But again, I mean, thanks a lot, I mean, very inspiring. I want to and thank. Yes, is a burden. Yes. <laughs> um, I really appreciated your remarks and also your remarks as well because um, there is so much there to agree with. When you have the erosion 
uh, between what is your work life and your personal life, uh, that already disappeared for me a very long time ago. So, you know, for many of us that are always on, always working, always connected by the mobile, uh, can, you know, connect to your work VPN and, and be working at all hours and we're in a global world when somebody is always working, the markets are always open, uh, those will just become more real when we are living in a, in a immersive world, physical and virtual, that is always on. When I think about some of the points that you just raised about the, the technical structures that are necessary, uh, we absolutely will need to have thought through the legal issues, the tax issues, and the accounting issues here because it is an economy. This idea of the, of the metaverse as being a unique identity coupled with an economy I think is very important. Um, metanomics is, is I think a term that I've heard somebody coin for that. And those disciplines and those professional bodies will need to work to define what does it mean to have legal rights in the metaverse, the, the tax implications as, as has been described and the accounting implications. And I think from an international law perspective, uh, perhaps we can look to some of our existing structures to consider what will happen when you have the opportunity for uh, disagreements, uh, contractual or, or otherwise criminal, uh, that are truly cross-border. Uh, somebody sitting, because do we all become citizens of, of one metaverse? And then what does that mean? So I think these are very important, very important issues. Um, and then, I think I just forgot your last question. What was your last question? Oh, finance, yes. Is everything financial? So this is something that I alluded to in my remarks. And when I was thinking about Web3 and the metaverse and how if you have a, web, a metaverse that is built, it doesn't have to be built on Web3, but if you do have it built on Web3 and that sort of achieves the open metaverse where people have said, you know, the total addressable market of an open metaverse could be $13 trillion uh, in the next uh, 10, 20 years then you have this financial transaction layer. But I don't know if I think of it so much as that everything becomes financialized or financial in nature or becomes tagged with the financial label. I think it's more the trend of the commoditization of experience. So if somebody wants to go to the top of the mountain and look at the view, somebody today will probably set up shop and sell you a ticket for it. And so I think of the utility token as more of a ticket um, an access to that as opposed to um, something that, that gives me a financial interest because I don't think I have a financial interest in the view from the mountain, but I think I, I, I am being charged for the access or the use or the enjoyment of it. So I think these are very important commercial issues that should be looked at through our regulatory regimes for trade and commerce and to think about what that is. But we have been dealing with the increasing commoditization of life, uh, for, of experience for years. And, and indeed, the transactional nature of life. I, I thought about it. Can you have life without money? I don't think so. You wake up in the morning, you want to go get your, your cafe, that's money. You, you take the bus to work, that's money. You put clothes on your body, you bought them with money. So in some ways, I feel that, that money is life. And what does that mean? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Carlo, yes. You already know Carlo Comporti. He's one of the five members of the council board. Yeah, we met. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, um, uh, uh, let me start by uh, uh, thanking once again uh, Caroline for being here. It's uh, really, uh, I would say, brilliant speech. Uh, inspiring and uh, a lot of uh, uh, fruitful thoughts for our joint, uh, let's say, uh, responsibility. The regulatory community, uh, let's say, is uh, facing uh, uh, what are common challenges and we have to face, uh, I would say, together. That is uh, the best way we can move forward. La, um, I, I start with a personal reflection. Uh, Paolo reminded, uh, let's say, uh, uh, generation of uh, kids. Uh, my my kids are uh, somehow younger than Paolo, and uh, I can witness uh, uh, how really metaverse is there. Probably even too much. 
uh, uh, they are, uh, let's say, uh, on the gaming, uh, uh, let's say, a lot of time. That is uh, somehow worrying as a, 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 as a parent. Uh, um, but um, uh, in reality, I, I, I see the, uh, what Paolo was mentioning, that uh, these may uh, ultimately result in a, in a shift in a jump directly from uh, the virtual. Okay, that's uh, something that we have to be uh, um, um, mindful of. I, I'm not necessarily concerned. I, it's something that is uh, happening. Okay, so how to address that matter of uh, uh, of our near future? Now, as a regulator, I think it, uh, I have three points, and uh, 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 between reflections and questions, let's start from the very uh, uh, top of the house, the traditional let's say, uh, philosophical question about technological uh, uh, neutrality of regulation. Now, um, there is a debate here, and uh, I heard you already uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the policy of the CFTC, and I, felt, I do understand also you are, let's say, uh, supporting this, that uh, uh, regulation should be uh, technological neutral, that in favor, uh, I would say that uh, um, we have always been, let's say, very much supportive of it. My question is whether this is uh, still uh, valid as a principle. Now, um, uh, and I've been discussing with the chair uh, other times. Uh, when you come to, let's say, uh, um, financial activities that are uh, intertwined into the blocks of a chain, and that cannot be dissociated. Can you really consider that uh, uh, the, the rules can be disentangled from the technological aspects? Okay, that is, uh, and uh, um, if I look at, uh, you mentioned the pilot regime, uh, that we are, let's say, there are different pilot regimes in, uh, in, in Europe, we do have uh, one at European level uh, that is about to start. I doubt that we can really think of uh, uh, these regulations as uh, 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 still remaining on the technological neutrality principle. So the, the, the question is really going forward, uh, can we really continue to consider that uh, uh, neutrality of uh, 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 technology in terms of uh, principles of regulation remains valid? Uh, DORA is another one where w in Europe we brought under oversight is not uh, supervision let's say the, the, the critical infrastructure cloud providers uh, let's say uh, the, the global players so that is another example um, the second point is uh, um, is about something that we uh, did face in the late 90s altogether uh, uh, by the way we started with IOSCO in uh, 1998 with the uh, criteria the principles for supervising the internet. I was around uh, in, in, in the community. And uh, um, it was a, a, an impressive experience. For the first time, we were all facing something completely new. We sat together and we came with a criteria for a certain jurisdiction, something that at the time was completely unknown, okay? The web was really completely unknown. It started with defense as being reminded, but then uh, once it entered the, uh, uh, our respective homes, we didn't know how to manage, okay? And uh, we came up with principles that honestly still stand, okay? Now, the question is uh, uh, whether, uh, say, the same approach, I truly believe that uh, this is the right approach. So uh, this is one of the good example. Uh, IOSCO and other fora would be uh, the, the, the good uh, uh, governance fora to run this, but whether the source of inspiration for the net at the time would still remain valid. And whether uh, the hooks that at the time or still the IP providers were ultimately consumed has the power to say shut down website others, whether in the metaverse, that's something that we can still rely or we have to change a completely paradigm. That is my, first, the, my second point. And the third one is, uh, um, we always, uh, let's say, uh, struggle, uh, the, the chair always say, how to uh, put the uh, technological in phase or in box of uh, the civil code. We, we are a civil code country, okay? 
irrespective of civil or common law, uh, uh, the, the, the question is how to, let's say, square the traditional regulatory approach with uh, the uh, uh, technological developments of the metaverse. And, uh, and uh, where we should start, what, what, what is the priority area that we should start facing to potentially re get the principles right? You said it should be principles based, but where to start if we have to change? Thanks. Okay, Carlo was in charge to close the conference. And uh, what I have to do is to thank you again. I benefited a lot from your expose and from the discussion. What we want uh, to, uh, to ask you uh, is to send to our American friends the message that Paolo has already stated to have a, an international conference to discuss this problem in order to reach an international agreement because uh, in the infosphere or metaverse, the problem is if it, we don't have the same regulation, I think that the, the situation uh, uh, can be managed very difficult. This is the message that we wanted to send and to give it to your hands. Thank you again. Grazie.